Welcome everyone to today's webinar. We'll give everyone just a few moments to log on here. Um, we're really excited about today. It's Women in Nonprofit Leadership. Before I hand it off to our amazing panel, um, there are a few housekeeping items I want to address. So for everyone joining us here for CPE today, make sure that you're actively responding to all of our polling questions. We're going to have four polling questions, and we definitely encourage questions. We have a ton of questions for our panel. If there's anything you want us to ask them, put it in the chat. Um, I'll help monitor them, and then anything we don't answer, we'll try and follow up with you after the call. Um, today's learning objectives are to review the unique journeys of these nonprofit leaders, recognize the challenges they overcame, and discuss how we can drive change together. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dean. Oh, so happy to be here with our excellent panelists. And before um, I pass it on to all of them to do introductions, I just want to say that, you know, they're here because we knew them when they didn't have the fancy titles that they have today. We knew them so much earlier in their career when they were uh, senior accountants and controllers, and now they have all of these amazing things. They have great impact and most importantly, great leadership, nonprofit or not, they're making it happen today. And we're really excited to showcase all of their learnings and share that with you. So with that, Jennifer, why don't you kick us off with introductions? Sure, thank you, Dean. Thanks everyone for being here. It's an honor to be asked to serve in this panel. I am Jennifer Hillen. I'm Chief Learning Officer at the National Business Officers Association. Uh, we work with 1,400 nonprofit independent schools around the country and, and really the world. Um, so friends of Armanino for a long time. I'm also past president of the Junior League of Nashville, which is a 1,600 women strong leader and community impact volunteer organization, one of the largest in the world. So nonprofit in, by day and night um, is sort of in my blood. I'm also a mom, a sister, a daughter, a friend, a volunteer, all, all the non-work titles that come along with it. So happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marlena, you're up. Thanks, Dean. Uh, welcome, everyone. So my name is Marlena Wong, and I am the CFO of the CREP Foundation. So a little bit of the, the CREP Foundation, we're a private foundation based in San Francisco, and we focus on strengthening the Bay Area and supporting the Jewish community in the US and Israel through strategic grant making to outside organization. Um, and I just don't wanna say that I'm only a CFO, I'm also a fierce partner to my fiance. I'm a daughter to immigrant parents. I'm an aunt who spoils their niece and nephews. And you know, I'm a friend. And also I could say that I am an investor and a real estate investor as well. Awesome. You almost made me cry right there. Okay. Um, Amy, you are up. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be on this panel. My name is Amy Omond. I'm the CFO of New Schools Venture Fund. We're a national venture philanthropy working to support education entrepreneurs um, in K-12 who are reimagining our educational system. Um, I have been in nonprofits for about the last 10 years, but started my career in public accounting and for profits. Um, so I have a mix of, of experience in both. But in addition to my professional resume, I'm also the mom of two amazing kids, teens and tweens, which is a really fun, exciting time um, as they're growing into adults. And last week, I just celebrated my 20th wedding anniversary with my amazing husband. So I am a wife and a mom um, and, a, and a CFO. So excited to be on this panel with these other amazing women leaders. Awesome. Glad you're here, Amy. Natalie, you're up. Hi, I'm Natalie Kwam, the CFO of Cal CPA Association and the Education Foundation. And prior to that, I'm a controller at the San Francisco Ballet. And prior to that, I... I did start my career like any good CPA in the for in the nonprofit uh, CPA public accounting role. Uh, when I'm not uh, doing CFO items, actually I am still doing CFO items. I'm also the co-chair of the CFO Leadership Council San Francisco chapter in the Bay Area, and I'm also the always a treasurer of a no, local nonprofit circus nonprofit. So in my off hours, I'm either being anti mame to my uh, twin nephews or I'm performing in circus arts. Uh, in the ear. Very cool, very cool. And Marie, your um, 
your picture is not on here, but we're going to have you introduce yourself as well because you're going to be a, a very great uh, panelist as well and asking some great questions today. Sure, of course. Um, so my name is Ray Leon. I'm an aspiring leader here at Armanino. I work in our marketing department, mostly focused on our nonprofit expert, um, efforts. And secretly, I'm here to make sure these ladies answer all of my questions. Um, so I'm really excited. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, we're going to we're gonna get after it. We're going to address many elephants in the room today um, around nonprofit, women, age, diversity, um, you know, mission, why. We're going to do all of that. So uh, let's do that. And, and like Marie said earlier, let's definitely, um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat. We will do our best to get to it. So the first question just has to do with just an industry focus. Why don't we talk about how you came to the nonprofit industry, right? And, and that's for anyone. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in. I, I feel like I, I did have a real inflection point, especially since I, I spent the first half of my career in for-profits, particularly food manufacturing and distribution companies, which was really exciting and interesting. Um, but when I, uh, I was actually went back to get my MBA and I took a class in social responsibility and just got really inspired by wanting to um, work for organizations that are just doing good in this world. So whether or not it's a, a B Corp like Armanito, um, I'm thrilled to say that, or a nonprofit organization that's really doing something uh, you know, right now, uh, the organization I'm working for is really working toward reimagining our educational system. That's really where I wanted to spend my superpowers. And I, I did spend a, a minute thinking, do I want to get out of finance and accounting? Like I've got my CPA, you know, I love my debits and credits, but is there something else I want to do? Um, and that's when I realized actually all organizations, especially nonprofits need our expertise. So I really doubled down and I said, you know what, this is where I want to be. I'm lucky that I can, I can spend my talents in any type of organization. So, so I kind of made the pivot into nonprofits and, and I'm thrilled that I did because having that mission and that role drive to come to work um, and, and know that your organization is making a real impact is really important. Amy, I'll um, dovetail on that and just say that I think you're right. You can have the best of both worlds, I think, in the nonprofit space. This isn't talked about a lot, but nonprofits are significant businesses at the end of the day, and they take you know, complex um, strategic leadership to really move them forward. So I became attracted to that as a career option myself. Um, I am a recovering CPA, I like to say uh, to all my CPA friends on the call, I will never let my license lapse. I am still a CPA, uh, but I'm not practicing. Um, after a few years at Ernst & Young that I would not trade for the world, incredible, incredible experience. I did, honestly, this is a safe space, right? So I can share that I um, grew exhausted by you know killing myself to at the end of the day produce a single piece of paper you know hopefully an unqualified audit opinion um, and I know it's so much more meaningful and necessary than that I don't mean to make light of it but I had the opportunity to make a huge shift into nonprofit education I myself was the product of an independent school and that really did change my life and my trajectory I never thought about it as a career option. I don't know many people who think about nonprofit service as a career option in terms of business. And I think that's something that's changed in recent years um, and, and could continue to change. So that's exciting. Um, but anyway, I, I, I made the shift to an all girls school to be in finance there. And then, um, you know, my career has gone in a totally different direction since in really exciting ways. But I was so attracted to the opportunity to blend both my business and finance experience with my passion for, in this case, a nonprofit mission serving girls in education. But there's so many amazing passions to be pulled into in this industry. So it's exciting. I can echo um, you, Jennifer, that I did not start my career in public in, in accounting thinking I would be part of a nonprofit. I did start um, actually through, through our Menino. And before I go to that, I will say, I thank you, Jennifer, for not uh, having a license left as a CPA, as a CFO of the CPA Association. But I actually started my career 
at a local non uh, local uh, CPA firm that merged with Armenino. And that's actually where I was introduced to the world of nonprofits. And I found that so fascinating that not only did we help put out that you know audit report, that opinion, but we also helped with a lot of best practices and a lot of metrics that are outside of the financial one about how many people, how many animals are saved and the services that they provide. And that was so much more rewarding to me than you know figuring out the dividends that a stockholder was going to get. So at some point in my career, I decided that I wanted to be in part on the down on, on the ground where we were actually implementing the best practices I was telling my clients to do. So, that, so I made the move to go to the San Francisco Ballet where I got to experience the day-to-day -day excitement of putting in the best practices and seeing how it results into the key metrics and how many uh, you know students we had in the ballet school. And then when the position of CFO opened up the Cal CPA, which also was an introduction uh, organization I was introduced to by Armino and Public Accounting. They were very supportive of me joining the board at the local level, moved up through Cal CPA, and now I'm at the CFO, and come back full circle where Armino is now our auditor. So it's, it's very rewarding to be one day on one side providing the suggestions to our clients, then putting them into practice and now being a client, all within the nonprofit world and still being able to provide value in all the different areas of my career. I'm going to echo all three of these ladies as well, because, you know, like them, I also didn't start in nonprofit as well. I started at PwC as an auditor, and then I moved towards the private equity, like alternative investment world. And finally, I was just tired. I was tired of just running, you know, waterfall calculations. And I'm going, when is this going to end? I can't do another quarter of this. And, you know, going through like SEC audits, I know I'm just tired. I want to do something more meaningful. And then this opportunity came up with Corette and I go, well, I do like the investment side of it. And I'm like, what else is it? And it was just a whole new industry for me and a, something that I had to learn. And, you know, with the help of Armanino on the both consulting side and on as they are uh, the audit side, they really have helped me through, you know, just learning about the industry that I was just not familiar with. So thank you. That's great. That's great. There were so many things there that I'd love to unpack, um, especially the fact that, you know, you all worked your way up the ranks and we'll definitely get to that in a second. One of the things that I think everybody uh, might be thinking right now is, wow, these ladies are very young. Uh, and they're all, you know, they have the, they, they're in the C-suite uh, and they're all very young. So let's talk about that. Because I think that uh, there is a preconceived notion that, you know, people go to nonprofit kind of at the end of their career, right? Like that's like the twilight type of thing. And you are all very, um, you know, young up and coming leaders with long careers ahead of you. Um, you know, how did that kind of come into play at all? And, and did you ever feel like, uh, is that something that, you know, in nonprofit, when you went into your role um, that you wanted to, that anybody asked about, hey, do you have the right experience for this role or anything like that? I could speak to that, that when I came to that role, I didn't have the experience. And, you know, it was a, a huge learning curve. You know, I think the first time I came to credit, I actually reached out to you, Dean, for help. And I go, um, maybe you guys could tell me a little bit about what you guys do around the nonprofit space. And, you know, I think I also had the same idea that I was going to do this way later in my career. But when I came over to nonprofit, and even now I'm still learning, and there's just so much to learn about the nonprofit space. And I've been connected to so many different organizations. And I'm like, wow, the business of nonprofit is just, there's so much to learn and grow around this business, no matter which industry you're in, whether you're doing schools, whether you're doing arts and culture, it doesn't matter. There is a business in it and there is so much to learn. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that maybe all of us at the risk of putting words in their mouths, um, saw an opportunity because there are so many opportunities in the nonprofit space. And so maybe we're pulled into it for our passions, but we stay because our passions are sustained. And there are also a lot of career path and growth opportunities if we look at them that way. Um, and, and also I agree with Marlene, it, you don't necessarily have the experience you need until you get started. And I think another great thing about nonprofits is that opportunity and the risk that, that organizations will take on 
people and that we could be willing to take ourselves and, and find some success there. And that's possible in, in the corporate world too. But I do think it's something unique about the, uh, the nonprofit industry. I was about to say independent school industry. That's where I live every day. It's true there too, but the nonprofit industry overall. Okay, great. What, what, um, what about, you know, you talked about that lack of perfect experience. How have you ladies overcome that? I think having a lack of experience is not necessarily a bad thing. It actually gives us the opportunity to ask more questions and the courage to say, I don't know what I don't know. And if you explain to me, I also have, I don't have something to go back on and say, this is how I used to do it, or this is what I think. It's more like I get more, I can be more open and get different opinions about that and, and really apply that and bring a new vision to nonprofits and, and to, you know, where you've historically said have been the end of someone's career. So they're looking for something that they were more settled and they're doing things, have they done it for the past, however long their careers are, but, you know, coming in with fresh ideas and fresh, um, you know, new viewpoint really actually benefits nonprofits in a way I think that they haven't had in the past based on historical um, positions. And Amy, you know, you, you're, you said you're a mom of a tween and a teen. And, you know, you're a CPA and you have an MBA. You told a story about uh, speaking up in your class about what about being a mom and what your ultimate goals were and, and kind of you want to tell that story real quick. because I thought that was really sure. powerful. Yeah, yeah. And it's 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 really all about being your authentic self. I think it also just ties back to recognizing what you don't know and making sure you can ask questions to all of the mentors that surround you. Um, the, the story that, um, that I told or that I was reflecting on was um, back when I was getting my MBA, before I was a mom, I was in a class um, about leadership. And one of the questions was, you know, what, what do you see as your most important uh, leadership goal, um, you know, as, as a person? I was one of the first people sort of in the round robin to answer. And I actually answered being a mom. I mean, it, it is sort of the most important life goal that I have is to raise these two beautiful humans that I have the privilege of living with. Um, and I just remember feeling a little like, oh, did I do that right? Because everyone after me answered with a more professional, like, I want to be a CFO. I want to be a, you know, entrepreneur. And, um, so I did have that moment of like, oh, maybe, maybe I did that wrong. Um, but now that I'm reflecting on it, no, that was me. That was my authentic self. And I am, I am privileged to work now in an organization where, you know, we all do bring our full selves to work every day. Um, I love working with my teammates and, and my other colleagues. And especially during the pandemic, we, we all have opened our living rooms up, um, you know, to, to see the messiness and the dirty laundry on the, on the couches. And, you know, that's, that's important that, that we can all share, you know, not just our professional lives, but our personal lives with each other as well. Love it. Okay. Um, question about diversity here. Are nonprofits open or more open, I should say, to female leadership, right? You're all C-suite folks at your nonprofits. Do you feel that way? Is that, is that a sentiment that, that you see and feel? I'm happy to start. Um, I I have definitely surrounded myself uh, by women in nonprofits, so it might have been by some of the choices I've made to go into girls' education or you know a women's uh, volunteer organization. I do think the opportunities in the nonprofit industry align well with the skills and interests of women. Just to get really general with it, which is not fair, and we want to break down those stereotypes today rather than build them up. Um, but I also think that, you know, I'll just say the thing, um, many of the same issues that plague the corporate world in terms of stereotypes about women and against women are still prevalent in nonprofits. I mean, that's the, the good and the bad side of nonprofits still being businesses and organizations at the end of the day. Um, but I do think women find themselves called to this kind of uh, career path because we're naturally inclined to go where our passions align. And so it's a great opportunity, but you also have to go in eyes wide open and know that it doesn't mean that some of those same issues aren't there and, and maybe frankly are even more prevalent um, and difficult to overcome. Yeah, no, that that is very true. Um, 
Marie, I knew this was going to happen. We're 20 minutes in, and we haven't asked one question yet. So can let's let's do that real quick. Yes, let me go ahead and launch the poll. So this first polling question is, what best describes your current role? We want to get a pulse of who's in the audience. So staff, senior staff, are you a student, VP manager, C-suite, retired, or other? Um, I'll give everyone just a few more moments to get those answers in. A few reminders here, just housekeeping. We are recording today. Um, you should expect an email within 48 hours of this recording. And then if any of your friends didn't join us, um, they will, you can share those links with them or if they registered, we'll email them as well. So let's end this poll. Okay, so that's what the breakdown looks like. like most people fall between VP manager or C-suite. And a bunch a, and a good amount of aspiring leaders yeah, as well, which awesome. is awesome. We're going to get to that question. We're going to get to that and all of the insight that these ladies are going to give to our aspiring staff as well. One of the things that we have to ask is, did you ever feel like you had to choose? Did you ever have to choose between your priorities, family, career, uh, things of that nature? Let's, let's talk about that. Did any of you feel like you ever had came to that fork in the road? Yes, I think when I was working in um, private equity venture, I, I felt that there was no life for me. And I think it wasn't until I came to the nonprofit world, you know, I have a great CEO who actually says, you know, family comes first. And I went, well, we'll see, because that's not what I'm used to in the for profit space. And what he's taught me is actually, you know, that's how, you know, we lead now we really lead and especially through the pandemic it's really important to give the moms, you know, what they need. It's been so hard for moms, I think, especially in the pandemic space of what's going on. So, you know, the, um, the, the way our leadership, the way we've taken our leadership is, hey, you know, we have to give the moms what they want because in return, they will perform and we know they will perform. Yeah, I'll add that um, every, everything's a choice, really. There's no possible way to do it all. I, I think we should resist the notion that we can't do it all, if that's going to hold us back. But we should also resist the idea that we have to. And I've fallen prey to the idea that I have to be everything to everyone. And um, that means that I'm not able to show up fully in any of my roles then that I wear. So it's, it's a lesson I've had to learn the hard way. Um, and I'll just share again in this safe space that I'm a single mom and I was taking on this leadership transition and totally new career path at a time when my personal and family life were changing overnight. And so I definitely felt like I had difficult choices to make, um, but I had some great, you know, great support system. And I pushed through, which was sort of against my nature, frankly, and sometimes against the nature of women. You know, we tend to say, okay, well, family first. And, and it's not to say that we shouldn't always have family first, but that doesn't have to come at the expense either of our careers or uh, the way we sort of show up in the world outside of our families. So one piece of guidance that has helped me is every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to someone. And that's okay. It just helps be sure that you're prioritizing the right decisions and right choices for you personally and professionally. And um, Jennifer, I love the fact that you say we can have it all, right? We just have to be intentional about it, right? Because right? That's, that's what we're going for. I know for me personally, it's like, if I say that I'm going to be a, I'm going to, you know, coach my daughter's soccer team, Right. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, I can't take any meetings on Tuesday at five o'clock because I'm on the soccer field with my daughter and uh, her group of TikToking 11 year old girls. Um, and, and, and if I say that no meetings on Tuesday at five o'clock, it's like, wow, Dean's such a great dad. Right. Oh, look at him. He's, he's doing his thing. But if a mom were to say that, it's like, oh, she's unavailable. Yep. Right. Is that true? Yes. Unfortunately, so true. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, we, that you as a male leader see that. Um, it's, it's prevalent. Why well, we just have, please. Oh, I have a question. So, I mean, we have those internal voices that tell us that we're not good enough um, for that. Using Dean's example of if I put on my calendar that I have to take care or pick up, help with child pickup, 
Um, how do we overcome that? Or what are your, what's your advice to women that, you know, put that on your calendar? You deserve that time just as much as anyone else you work with. Um, what would you say to those women? I would say just do it. And I, I know I'm in the, the privileged position now as CFO to model that for my team. Sometimes I joke, you know, I'm, I'm the one with the lowest PTO accrual balance because I do take all my vacation. I was just on vacation last week. I, I have an amazing team who, you know, was able to step up and um, cover for me. So I try and model that now as a leader. Um, you know, back when I wasn't a leader, uh, I also just wanted to lead with that authenticity. And, and I've been privileged to work in organizations that have really embraced that, both my for-profit um, previous organizations and nonprofit. I, um, I feel like it's really more about the people that you're with, um, recognizing what's important, being able to um, you know, obviously show up when you have that work deadline and like, you know, put in the time and the, the effort when needed, but knowing when, you know, you do need to, um, rest and recharge and take those vacation days, um, and not, not fall prey to that, um, you know, that, that busyness cycle that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just always so busy and so overworked. Um, you know, we, we need to now model that for everyone that, that, that we work with, um, to make sure that the people are taking the time for themselves. You know, there's something I'll take from our male colleagues, which is women, I think women can truly multitask and they do pretty well at it. And yet I envy men who get focused on one thing at a time. And I, I wanna try to emulate that in this example, um, so to speak. So show up fully to work when you're there, but then show up fully to your commitments outside of that and carve out the space and time for those and try to resist feeling guilty about it, which is easier said than done. Um, but that that's the way to kind of fight that double standard. Um, and both of those things deserve your time and energy. Um, so, so really try not to feel guilty about it. It's okay. Absolutely right. It is absolutely okay. Um, we're seeing the chat board light up and there's a lot of talk about leadership journey. So we are going to get into that in one second. One more question though that we just have to ask. There is this, uh, you know, misconceived wrong notion out there that women are catty with other women. Can we address that real quick? Can we just put that to bed? I think I raised this in our planning call. I've been talking a lot, but I'm just gonna keep going. Um, yes, I think there's, this is another stereotype that I would love to break down. Um, it's not to say it doesn't exist for a reason, but I think that women also uplift other women and it's incumbent upon us to recognize that both male and female leaders who have come before us and helped us get to where we are um, particularly pointing to the women and do the same for the women who come after us. Um, there was a study from NYU, I can try to drop it in the chat, but it showed that some staggering number, like 89% of women were more likely to have loftier career goals if they discussed them and emulated them based on, with and based on other women who they perceive to be leaders, more so than men. And that's not to say there's not plenty we can learn from men as well, but I think there's something really special about women lifting up other women. And it's really important that we all recognize and do that. I think it's important that we do that also from the top down. I think this group here probably emulates that. And I found throughout my career, as I, as I grew into it and met more women in the C-suite or in higher levels, we were actually are more supportive of each other and our staff alone. I think that's helping us, you know, lead by example and have the newer, gener newer not generation, but the uh, incoming uh, managers and, and CFOs and controls out there see that, that we aren't that stereotype and really being supportive is the best way to continue to, to move up and, and be there for each other. The way to change that stereotype that we're actually going to be more supportive and it's more beneficial overall. Natalie, I see that all over the place. I'm so glad you brought that up. I do see groups of strong women that that um, 
you know, stay together and help each other. And, you know, if I could swear, you know what I'd say right now, they just go out there and kick some, you know. Uh, anyhow, okay, with that said, let's talk about the leadership journey. Kate had a great question, and it is, how slash when did you feel comfortable making the jump from manager, controller, director into that C-suite? I think we can, we can go on this for a little bit. So somebody, please start, um, and, and let's talk about this. Are you ever ready? No, I don't think you're ever ready. And I think also... The scariest thing is, you know, you, you have all these like dialogues in your head, like, what if they say no? What if this? What if that? And I think you just have to get over that hump and ask for it. You know, the, the fact that you feel like you're, you are ready, I think my advice is to ask. And for me, like each time I've done it, it was I'm like, I'm really scared. I don't think they're going to say yes. I don't know what they're going to do. And then I write down and prep up. I'm like, wait, I've done this and this and this. I'm going to ask. And if they come back and say no, then I'm going to say, well, what do I need to do about it? And the funny thing is every time I have asked, nobody has said no. <laughs> Love it. You just have to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, the issue with that question is the word comfortable. Uh, comfortable implies easy and it's not always easy you just have to get over your discomfort or, or push through it not get over it because it's very real um just n don't let fear and discomfort hold you back and that's speaking from someone who has let it hold me back at times but when i take the leap and i push through it ends up being so much better in the end and and let's face it again i'll just say the thing how often do men turn down opportunities or say well i'm not going to go for that because i'm not qualified they don't, they go for it, they figure it out. We should do the same and, and we do. Yeah, and that's definitely a part of my story as well. I just feel like I was pretty persistent over the years after spending you know, or, uh, several years as director and controller level of just saying, it's my goal you know, to become a nonprofit CFO and just making sure that was really transparent to my mentors and managers above me and um, was fortunate to, to have that happen here at New Schools. Um, so just being, being uh, uh, transparent with your goals and, and exactly what Marlena said, sort of what, what do I need to do to get there and, and um, having that path of growth laid out for you. Let's talk about allies. Did you seek anyone out, whether in your organization or outside of your organization, as you made that jump um, to the C-suite? I definitely found people both outside and within my organization when I made that change. I um, I have several, I've been lucky throughout my career to have several mentors by me, both male and female. And, um, all, and all of them, when I made the change to um, control of the CFO said, you know, just do it. And I was like, I don't think I'm qualified. I've never done it. I haven't had the, you know, I had a set path that I think I need to have X amount of training from my CFO. I need to do some more classes. I need to do this and that before I go into this. And there were, and, and I was like, you're never going to be ready. They offered you the job. <laughs> you should take it. <laughs> Don't hold yourself back when you're given this opportunity. They think you can do it, so you must be able to do it. And, and that's the point of having a mentor and asking for, you know, people see you differently than, they all, than you see yourself always. Do you want to go, get that opinion from them, whether it's good or bad, but people will always be truthful for, to you and help you move forward uh, when you're sure you, when you think you can't do that. So it was a big jump when I thought I wasn't ready. Um, and sometimes I still think I'm not ready, but here I am. So <laughs> I'm, I'm still here. Awesome, Natalie. Let's talk about one, you know, technical aspect of the job. Um, you all talked about the leap from controller to CFO and how it was different in the day to day. Um, how the responsibilities and the vision and the leadership, how it all um, kind of challenged you in a different way. Does anybody want to talk about that? Uh, I can talk about it. I, I think, you know, I, um, as an accountant, I think most accountants, including myself, I would say that we're introverts. So I'm really comfortable with my spreadsheets. I'm really comfortable with data and going like, here's the facts, it's very black and white. But I realized that, you know, being in this position, this lead, there's a responsibility. And part of that responsibility is really in the listening of others. You know, it's creating a culture because you're in a leadership position. So you have to create a culture and like what works for this culture, you know, for us, 
they're, they're mostly women in this, um, in my organization. So it's like, what works for them? And it's really taking the time to listen and to hear what they have to say. And even the, how are you doing? And getting to know them and getting to know like what's really important for them and like what works and doesn't work. And, you know, that takes a lot of empathy and compassion. And, you know, through the years, I like, you know, had to kind of hone that skill set. And actually from that skill set, what I've learned is that I've become more compassionate and empathetic for myself. And that was a big learning curve for me to be more empathetic and compassionate to myself. Awesome. What about leadership? Um, what about leadership style? Do you feel like you have a different leadership style than because of your the way that you came up or you know your background, being female, anything that any comments on that? I definitely think that women are uh, different leaders, different kinds of leaders than men, and that's a good thing. Um, it can be really tempting because we see men in very high powered, successful roles for us to think that we need to emulate exactly how they got there and their leadership styles. Whereas instead we should embrace the differences that make us strong leaders. And, and again, I'm generalizing here, but I think it would ring pretty true from what I know of these great panelists here with me. We're collaborative, we're attention, attentive to sort of that EQ factor that she was just describing, um, relationship building. I think balancing the left and right sides of our brains um, is what really makes us unique in terms of leadership. Like we can still live in the spreadsheet space, we can still be tactical and solve problems, but we can also be strategic and visionary and should embrace those, those feminine tendencies, frankly, rather than trying to suppress them and be one of the guys. Absolutely. What resources, great question, Betty, um, are you using to help you, you know, become more strategic in your leadership or, you know, get the right expertise? Is anybody, um, you know, doing a little bit more than just learning on the job? I, I do utilize my CFO group. I joined the CFO Leadership Council specifically because it was more of a um, soft skills leadership group versus the technical. We do have some technical um, discussions in CPE, but a lot of it is really the you know challenges a CFO faces in in this world, especially with you know COVID and, the, and a lot of CFOs manage HR or touch it in some way or have to deal with the financial impact. And it's been great to like to talk with the other CFOs, and it's really the connection of having either whether they're female uh, peers or colleagues or um, you know, just other CFOs and controllers is good to always get that um, other experience from other people. So I use that a lot outside of the technical area. Technical, obviously, I, I have a lot of resources in my fingertips in my organization, always at Armanino for the technical portion, but you know, really the strategy and discussions of how it's affecting our day-to-day -day life comes from talking to other people in that same experience, that same level as you. Awesome. Awesome. Is there any other, before we get to another um, CPE question here, and we could definitely, because this is just so good, Marie, maybe we'll do a quick question and then we'll jump back. Okay. I'd love to share, just going back to your, your first oh, question, please. resources, um, uh, because yes, there's, there's the technical resources that Cal CPA and, and Natalie mentioned, which are great. Uh, a few that came to mind for me were more of the adaptive leadership type resources that are important um, in, in everything that Marlena and Jennifer were saying just about, about interacting with, with others um, on your executive team. We utilize resources from the Management Center, um, which is a, a consulting uh, organization specifically to nonprofits. They provide, um, they actually have a ton of resources on their website as well that um, are about, you know, different check-in structures um, for your team and how to think about goal setting. Um, so those are sort of great leadership um, and, and adaptive resources that, that we've utilized, as well as um, we've engaged this year with the National Equity Project, which is another organization that's really helping us dig in on our um, uh, analysis of our organization's uh, commitment to DEI um, and setting up our systems and structures to really lean into our, our values there. So I just wanted to share those, those two quick resources. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, Marie. Let me go ahead and launch the next polling question. So the question is, does a woman currently occupy your CEO position at your organization? So yes, no, or not sure. 
And let's see, I'll give everyone just a few moments to get the answers in for CPE. Looks like, oh, you're all really quick. Let me go ahead and share that. Um, so it looks like 59% oh, answered no, um, and then 40% answered yes. And let's Interesting stats there. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. Before I hand it back over to Dean, I actually have a personal question. Um, so we talked a lot about defining your voice, um, embracing female tendencies. Um, let's talk about imposter syndrome because personally, as an aspiring leader, that's something I currently struggle with all the time. Um, how do you turn off your internal negativity? Because I think that's how I view imposter syndrome. It's always saying you can't do something. And you know, you all have wonderful mentors that are saying you can do it, and you do these great things. Um, how do you battle that? How do you overcome that internally? And how do you turn off your voices and listen to the external things? Because I do think that if enough people around you are saying you're doing great things and you can do this, you should believe them and not yourself. Um, so thoughts? I don't think it ever goes away that voice that you're not good enough. And I think, you know, as you get move up, there is that voice that constantly comes on. And I think that's why it's important to have other females and other men as well mentors, you know, like we were talking before this called Dean's like talking about coach, you know, I hired a coach as well to, um, you know, like ask for kind of hey, you know, what is it, where are my blind spot that I'm not seeing in myself, you know, or when I get in like a really bad, you know, in a bad place, I lean on my girlfriends and, you know, who are also in the, those kind of leadership position. I'm like, uh, I'm having these thoughts and am I crazy? And, you know, they have these thoughts. And I think in that sharing and being vulnerable with each other, you know, then we're able to go, okay, this, this dialogue is always going to be running in our heads, but you know, we can stop it. I actually just listened. We were before the call talking about our love of podcasts. And this was a, a, another Brene Brown podcast. If the audience is familiar with her, um, she did one with Lori Santos of the happiness lab, a different podcast. Um, they were talking about those internal voices in your head. I definitely suffer from that, um, of, of that imposter syndrome. And I love the framework that they shared, which was to actually thank those voices, you know, like they are speaking from a place of trying to protect you, you know, and, and while they might not necessarily be speaking truth, um, and you do need to listen to the external people and, and believe them in, in, you know, when they share with you that, that, that you're worthy, um, those, those internal voices, are, are, are meaningful. They come from, you know, a deep place within you that are, that are ultimately trying to protect you. So you can thank them and then tell them to move on. Um, you know, that, that they, they aren't necessarily speaking truth that, that you shouldn't be in the position that you're in. You shouldn't, shouldn't be speaking on a women in leadership panel that Armanito invited you to, for example. Um, but, uh, um, you know, uh, just to kind of have that dialogue, thank them for their input, um, and then set them aside and, and move on. I think that's a really good point, Amy. You can try to ignore them, but if, if you do that, they won't go away. If you maybe practice mindfulness and try to acknowledge them and and appreciate those feelings and those voices and allow yourself the time and space and energy to sort of think through what about that might be valid and how you can mitigate it. And then the, you know, the, the 90% of it that is invalid and, and why you are worthy, then you can sort of make your own case to yourself about why you should be there. And then if you ever are questioned, which you likely won't be, because I think everyone in the world, frankly, suffers from imposter syndrome, but you're prepared with, no, really, this is how I got here. This is why I'm here. This is why I should be. And this is where I'm going. Um, I don't think imposter syndrome is unique to women. I do think women give into it or, or you know, give it maybe more space than it deserves. Uh, but find a leader who doesn't suffer from it. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. <laughs> Amen. Most leaders are humble enough to, to admit their own. I was going to say... Jennifer, amen to that. Like, if I'm as the only male on this call, like, yeah, am I ready for my next job? Am I doing everything that I want to do to get where I want to go? 
You know, I, I talk to people about that all the time. And, and, and I loved everything that you all just said. The only thing I would add to that is that, you know, if I do or when I do see the holes that I'm like, wow, are you ready for that? Is that, you know, are, can you do that? Then I start putting together little action plans. Exactly. Because, right, when you start to feel a little overwhelmed, a little bit of action will make you feel better. You're like, well, at least yeah. I'm doing something about it, right? Exactly. I, I feel that way too, Quentin. Like when I, when I, that little voice in my head thinks, "Are you not good enough? Are you really? Are you in the right place?" I look at that as kind of motivation. Like I'm going to prove myself wrong, and I'm going to, to do the steps I need to do. But how can I make myself, you know, move past this? What do I need to do to learn what I think I don't know, or ask the questions, and then actually pushes me through that, and then I can tell myself, "I told you so. I can do it." <laughs> I love it, Natalie. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're heading down the home stretch. I think let's get question three out there uh, real quick, Marie. So this third one is, do you currently have a mentor? Um, so yes, not yet, but you're going to get one or no, uh, which I really like this question. So you all talked about having mentors um, and I'm sure you have folks that you also mentor yourselves. So I think that when I, what I, from what I've heard, that's a pers- uh, really important part of growth. Um, so let's see what the audience said. Okay. Okay, sweat. really? Excited for really that 17%. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's talk advice um, to the next generation, to your younger self. Let's talk about that. You know, uh, there's probably a good amount of female professionals on here that are looking uh, to get uh, promoted or looking at the next step in their career, kind of like what we were just talking about. Uh, what would advice would you give uh, to them, especially if they're looking at nonprofit leadership? Any any comments that you would like to, to pass down? I, I, I'll start with, you know, speaking up. You know, I wish that I, when I was younger in my career, spoke up in so many different ways, either whether it was promoting myself and tooting my own horn because I didn't do that as much as I could have to help, you know, move forward, whereas some of my counterparts, male ones, would, you know, talk about the things that they were doing and how well they did in this client. And I was more like, oh, I'm just, I'm just doing my work, keeping my head down, it's going to go through. And I also definitely did not speak up enough about taking the time for myself that I should have um, for myself and my family and my personal life where now I'm very much like, this is my time. I, I have to teach circus every Monday. So I'm going to leave the office and that's not negotiable. No means after four, so I can make sure I get there. And that's something that I probably would never have done in my younger career of, you know, saying I need to go to the gym. Or I need to do this. This is my personal time. I just said, okay, I'll work. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, I'll do it. So I think that just speaking up more um, as a woman in either nonprofit or for-profit is something that we all should be doing more of. I agree. I can piggyback on that and say that I was really tempted. This actually goes back to your age question at the very beginning, Dean, and I think just some thoughts that women may be naturally prone to have. I was tempted to have every answer for every single question or problem. And then it would really stress me out when I would try to have the answer, but I knew I didn't. And I've evolved. I still fall into this trap at times, but don't be afraid to ask the questions. I think Amy and others mentioned this earlier, but I just want to reiterate it because it's so important. Oftentimes the ideas that are generated from asking the questions rather than pretending to have the answers take you and the organization that much further. So embrace that. And then I would also say to carve your own path or follow your own path. This speaks back to not, you know, have male mentors and allies in addition to female, but don't feel like you have to change your tendencies, you know, embrace what makes women unique as leaders and lean into that and step away from it. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to dovetail on that with regarding mentorship. Like I know I, I, I basically think of every conversation I have as some type of mentorship, if it's someone that's in finance and accounting or not, you know, sort of who, who can I learn from, um, you know, based on my goals. I, 
when I think about like the idea of mentorship, it's not like there's an application process and I'm okay, you three people will be my mentors. You know, I just, I think about it in a much, uh, a, a much broader sense. You know, my, my teammates um, are my mentors, my um, colleagues, um, past people that I've worked with, just kind of keeping up those connections over the years and, um, you know, having those great conversations about how people have learned and, and grown in their careers that can help inform, you know, how, how you see your path going as well. I think um, my advice is really like to have courage. You know, I think if I look back in my career, there are times that I didn't feel that I had the courage, kind of like Natalie, where I go, I should speak spoken up on that. And I did it. And I think if I look back at my career and I said, where are the times that I actually said, have some courage and spoke to myself and say, get, have some courage and speak up or have the courage to ask this person to be your mentor. And, you know, through all the times that I had courage, I think it's worked out better than I can anticipate. I love that, Marlena. That's right. I, I think that people in the finance and accounting industry actually need courage training. Um, just in general, I think we're so afraid to have that engaging conversation that might have some bumps in it. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Have, have courage. So great. Look at that. My OG mentor. That is so I cool, know. Amy. Chris Venturini is on the call. And I remember that I, she, she and I worked together at Dryer's Grand Ice Cream. She had kids. She was most definitely one of my mentors when I was learning accounting. We were on the general ledger team together. Um, and I just uh, miss you, Chris. So happy that you're out there. That's so great. I will uh, tell everyone one, one other thing about mentors. Um, they don't have to be, uh, they don't have to be older than you either. Uh, one of my mentors is my younger sister. My younger sister is a beast. I mean, she's, she's beat me in everything my whole life. Uh, you know, I got a 4.0. She was valedictorian. I did this. She did that. She loved beating me. She still beats me today. We go golfing. She smokes me in that. Every I mean, she's a beast, and she she runs a team of professionals at Apple, and we talk all the time, right? And when she told me that she got turned down for a role three years ago, um, it hurt, right? It hurt her. It hurt me, um, and she of course got bypassed for the super long in the tooth. Um, older gentleman uh, that didn't look or act or anything like her. And so three years later, when the role became available, she was like, that's mine. I'm getting that. That's my job and I'm going to go get it. And just how fierce she is. And so we talk all um, the time. So I just want to encourage everyone that, and she's not in, she's not in my industry. Um, I'm just lucky that, you know, she's my sister. Um, and I definitely go to talk to her about uh, a lot of things. So just want to encourage everyone there that, you know, it, they're all around you. Like Jennifer said, I, I go to the ones that, you know, have the skills or you think have the skills and they'll tell you that, yeah, I, I didn't have the skills and I acquired them and I fought for them and I, and I did that. So, okay, Marie, where are we now? So let's ask our last polling question so that we don't forget. Oh yeah, um, get that CPE in. <laughs> So only you guys can launch this. So this one is, do you currently feel supported by your manager? So yes, sometimes, or no. I'll give everyone a few moments to put that in. And then Dean, maybe you can talk about, you touched on a little bit about your sister being an influence. Um, and you do a lot of personal education um, and you, I know you did a lot to prepare for this we webinar in general. So can you talk about the women in your life and why supporting women is important to you and the influences you have, your sister, your wife, your daughter, your mom? Um, I think it'd be important to share the personal education you take on and you take ownership of that. Um, I think it'd be really good to share a bit of that story. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the easy answer is I have very, very strong women in my life who are not afraid to tell me exactly the moment that I slip up and they tell me and my sister goes, no, you just did it again. Stop and notice that and we're going to fix that. And I go, okay, great. My wife is the same way. My mom, but I have a daughter, right? And, and I just, I want 
what's best for all of them because I, I see the future they have. I see the future of our professions and, and all of that. So I just, I just want to be the best leader that I can be, right? We talked about that earlier, Jennifer. You said that when you don't know, you're allowed to say, I don't know. And what I like to do is I like to pull in experts around me saying, hey, here's a, here's a problem. How could we make this our problem? And we can come together as a solution together, not one person thinking that they have it. So that's one thing. I definitely believe in the teamwork approach. I do like to you know, read different books or listen to different podcasts and, and get educated. Um, and then I would also say that um, I found myself in meetings and people would be talking to me and they would say, okay, and then they would want me to like go to one of my other female coworkers and like get the answers or, or direct or, or whatever. And I was like, number one, I don't have the time for that. And number two, they're very capable of handling all of this, which is Marie, why I pull you up everywhere we go. And our old colleague, Debbie Fossum and Drea Jordan. And I was like, don't ask me, ask them. They're right there. And you could just, and I don't need to be the middle person anymore. And it gives you, and all we talk about, right, Marie, is the opportunity is yours. Go take it. Show off your expertise. No one knows it more than you. Go for it, right? And I'm just a big believer in that. I don't, like, you're the expert, and I believe in you, and I know you can do it. So I, I don't know how I, I, how I got there other than the fact that I just have a lot of strong women in my life, and, um, and it means a lot to me. So I'm fiercely... Um, but, a defender of that, I guess. <laughs> um, okay. Any other comments? We're up to our last three or four minutes, ladies. I mean, this has been fabulous. We're probably going to have to cut this up and snippet it. And there's just so many knowledge bombs that have been dropped today. But maybe if we can just ask uh, for a closing remark from each of you real quick uh, before we wrap up, just on, um, you know, what you would uh, – what you see for women in the future, uh, especially in the C-suite or in finance and, and just any, any great last words. With the risk of being provocative, I will offer a challenge to everyone here. I'm challenging myself with this at the same time. Um, this can happen to anyone, men or women, but I do think it happens more frequently to women, which is that our ideas and our points are not heard or given the same airspace as the same ideas or points maybe from men. I can't tell you how many times I've been in conversations where I will say something and it sort of falls flat and then a male colleague will say the same thing and it's very well received. So a colleague of mine who I respect and admire challenged me to say, thank you for emphasizing my point and regain regain sort of ownership of, of those ideas, not that you won't be collaborative and they'll be better off once you talk them through with your male and female colleagues. But that's that's just one challenge I wanna offer us all is to keep your voice and ask those questions and, and stay strong. You have value and don't be afraid to, to show it. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to, um, what Jennifer and Dean just mentioned, it's, it's all kind of wrapped up in my idea of allyship as well. Like we, as women need to speak up, we also need to be allies for people that we might see uh, around the room that aren't getting their voices heard. Um, so if it's, you know, our uh, diverse colleagues, um, uh, we've also been talking a lot about gender dynamics, of course. Um, I happen to have a gender non-conforming child, so that's someone that I've also been learning from, you know, non-binary and, um, you know, gender fluidity, thinking about, so, so not just falling into um, stereotypes of people, but really seeing everyone as the special individual that they are and making sure that, uh, you know, now we as leaders and as colleagues are bringing out the best in everyone. I think women are going to continue to, to grow in, in their careers and take you know, take over the world, I guess. I mean, just being on this call and what the change I'm seeing within organizations for, for profit and nonprofit, more women are stepping up in the C-suite. I think we're all leading by example. And as long as we continue to encourage the future generations to follow us and, and show that they can do that, I think we're going to see a, a much better split 
in terms of positions and power in the higher level. I think that's starting by being here and us speaking to everyone in Armenino, providing us this opportunity to share our careers with everybody. And I think lastly, it's also about abundance. There's abundance of opportunity out there. And I think for women who don't feel like, oh, you know, if this person has this role, I don't have this role, but to actually come from a space of abundance and that I think, you know, there's abundance of mentors out there. There are abundance of opportunities out there. There's abundance of panel speaking events. If you just have the courage to go for it and say, yes, like I will do this for you guys. Um, so thank you, you know, Armenio, and I am so honored to be part of this panel with like the group of women and, you know, thanks Dean for introducing us. And on behalf of the entire Armenino community, we thank you. We, I, I just don't have enough words to say how awesome this has been. Uh, we'll do this again. Thank you for your, uh, your leadership and sharing it with everyone. We can't see, wait. To, con uh, to continue to see the impact that you will make in the future. Thank you all. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much.